Okay, everybody, um, let's, let's, let's get going. Thank you all for being here. Um, welcome to the Foreign Correspondents Club of Thailand and those of you who are joining us online. Um, my name is Steve Needham. I'm the Regional Communications Officer for ILO Asia Pacific based here in Bangkok. Um, welcome to this launch of the Asia Pacific Employment and Social Outlook 2024. Sometimes we refer to it by its acronym of a, a PESO. So if you hear a PESO get mi mixed in somehow, that, that's what we're talking about. Um, this this is, a, is a major ILO publication for the region. Uh, we, we produce this every two years. Um, it looks at labor market trends and projections for Asia and the Pacific. But every edition, we also do something a little different. Um, two years ago, we looked at various sectoral employment in construction, in agriculture, etc. This time around, we've looked at the issue of aging, aging populations, which I think everybody is uh, is obviously very interested in and the impacts this will have um, on, on the labor markets going forward. Um, we have three, hello, have I gone? We have three speakers here with us today. Um, Ken Shamuvashawa is our senior economist of the ILO Regional Office for Asia and the Pacific. His unit produced this report and uh, Ken will run us through the main findings. We're also very happy to have here with us two distinguished speakers who will help give their insight and, an, an, and excuse me, put my teeth back in, an analysis on the findings. Um, we have with us Associate Professor Dr. Ruti Abula Orr, who is the Vice Dean of the um, College of Population Studies and Director of the Collaborating Center for Labor Research of Chulalongkorn University. And we also have with us Dr. Sinavas Tata, who is the Director of the uh, the Social Development Division of the UN United Nations um, Economic and Social Commission for Asia and the Pacific, UN SCAP, who are here to give their, their insight and input. Um, we'll do the usual thing. Following Once everyone's spoken, we'll, we'll turn to the floor and online for any, any Q&A. Um, the press release is available. The report is also available. If, um, if you want to grab one, there's, a, there's a, a QR code at the front of the room, or you can pick up a, a physical copy. If you're following us online and you want to get a copy, please drop your email address in the chat and we can, we can email one over to you. Um, the, the embargo for the press release is down as 3 p.m. Bangkok today. Okay, that's, uh, that's good, all from me. Okay, let's get going and I will hand the floor to Ken who will run us through the, uh, the findings of the report. Ken, over to you. Thank you so much, uh, Steve. Uh, again, welcome everybody uh, to this uh, very important launch of the APESO. Um, I'll start by just giving these figures for um, a region that is so heterogeneous, a region that has 4.4 billion people, 36 countries, that has sub-regions of East, East Asia, Southeast Asia, South Asia and Pacific, with populations ranging between 10,000 to 1.4 billion, but also having GDP per capita incomes that are hugely different, 1,400 to about 102,000 in dollars. This is, uh, colleagues, a region that has 2 billion people in employment. As you can see, uh, our graphs there, our graph there, showing two important um, labor market indicators that have uh, taken a decline since the 1990s. Um, the labor force participation rate, which is uh, at 60.5% um, in 2024, will eventually get to 60.1% uh, in 2026. The employment to population ratio at 58.2 will eventually go to 57.4 uh, in 2026. But we've also seen that uh, as the decline came in, then we got a deeper decline because of the pandemic. Um, but again, we have had uh, a full recovery. Uh, as you can see that from 2020, we got an upward trend. Um, but why this decline? So two important issues really uh, uh, have influenced uh, this decline. The, the first one is that um, the population is aging. 
So aging is important, and it happens uh, when some fundamentals in uh, the labor market change. So for example, uh, whether it's life um, uh, expectancy increases, but also uh, sometimes um, fertility rates are going down. Each of those factors can affect aging or both of them. But at the same time, we have seen uh, youth uh, participation rates going down in the region, and, most of the, uh, and mostly it's because uh, of uh, youth enrollment in education. So these two factors um, uh, can explain the persistent decline that we have seen since the 1990s to date. Interestingly, um, the employment rate remains at 4.2 percent, and this is seen not to change uh, next year. But when you look at that in terms of the unemployed people, in terms of the absolute numbers, that does translate to about 88 million people. But it's also interesting that as we look at unemployment numbers, we also look at another subset of people who want employment but are not searching. Um, so they could be discouraged workers. They could be people who may want employment, but they're facing barriers. It could be childcare. It could be something like that. Now, when we look at that number, 76 million in the region, and if you add that to those who are unemployed, we get a figure of 164, which really um, should be seen as the total number of unmet need for employment, which is called the jobs gap. And that gets to about 8% uh, in the region. So apart from just the unemployment issues, we have cases of people wanting to work, but who are not searching. And the jobs gap does define kind of uh, a better uh, indication of, of the labor market in terms of employment and those uh, who are not looking for, who are looking for it, but are not, uh, who, who want it, but are not searching. At the same time, uh, the region has a 22% rate uh, of uh, youth who are not in employment, education, uh, or uh, training. But I think what's more interesting is that we do see gaps, gender gaps, in terms of the need rates with women having 32% and um, the men just having 12%. Uh, percent. Uh, but again, it's important uh, to take note that um, when we look at gender gaps in general, um, the global uh, figures compared to uh, what we have in the region, uh, we have relatively smaller gender gaps uh, in, in, in this uh, region. In fact, uh, in this region, we have an employment rate for women which is actually lower than that of men. So interesting uh, figures there, particularly the 32% and the 12% uh, for need rates. In terms of quality of work, there has been slow progress in the region. So we see people who are working, but who are actually in the informal employment, and the figures are 1.3 billion people. This means two out of three workers are actually in informal employment. 66% uh, of the people that are actually uh, in formal uh, employment. But again, uh, when we look at these figures again, we realize that uh, workers that are living in extreme poverty um, amount to about 17, 73 million. But of course, taken together, uh, when we look at um, you know, those who are in extreme poverty, those who are in moderate poverty, and those who are in formal employment, we see that these numbers have actually increased uh, between 2022 and uh, 2023. So yeah, there is some slow progress there to improve quality of work. And of course, the pandemic uh, you know, gave us more difficulties. But again, uh, we have not done much in terms of uh, improving quality of work uh, since the pandemic. But Asia and the Pacific is the fastest aging region in the world today. 
if you look at the uh, ratio of the population of age 65 plus to that age 15 64 we see the uh, we see that the asia and pacific will double that ratio between 0. Point, uh, between 2023 and 2050 in fact it will be it will move from 0. 0.15 to 0. 0.3 but again when you look at that region and you try to look at the sub regions you see a lot of heterogeneity we see for example that east asia has the highest ratio uh, moving from 0. 0.23 to 0 0.53 in 2050, seconded, of course, by the Pacific and the South Asia, 0 0.1 to 0 0.21 is the last. But again, uh, if you look at the report, we also have details of, of countries. But just to give an example here, you see that um, it's not the whole region that is actually aging. It's, um, Pakistan, for example, it doesn't seem to be aging that fast, 0 0.07 to 0 0.10 as a ratio in 2050. But again, if you look at Korea, Republic of Korea, it gets to 0 0.75. And of course, there are countries there like Japan as well, Thailand as well, uh, which uh, are also you know, high up there in terms of the ratios uh, of uh, population aged 65 plus to that of 15 to 64. But what is the main message here? The our, uh, the, those in the high income countries doubled that ratio in 60 years. Asia and Pacific is going to double that ratio in 27 years. So the speed uh, of you know, uh, population aging is really high uh, for Asia and Pacific. And of course, that uh, will also mean a lot of other things that will be important to ameliorate uh, the effects that can come with such kind of, you know, speed. So of course, aging, and of course we have talked about uh, youth uh, participation rates going down, they all have an impact uh, on labor force participation. And of course, this has been falling. If you look at um, the sub-regions, you see that almost all the sub-regions uh, will have a falling labor force participation rate, um, you know, from 1991 to 2050. If you look at the Asia Pacific itself as a whole, you see that uh, that percentage will move from 67 to about uh, 55. It is important to note um, the kind of concomitant uh, relationship or challenges that will come with this. One of it is that then you get your economic dependency ratios high because uh, the ratio of those who are employed to those who are, not, who are not employed becomes larger and larger. We see here that uh, between 2023, the economic dependency ratio would jump from 0 0.7 to about 1 to 0 0.9 there. That is huge. And that, of course, means that um, we all have considered efforts to do uh, to ensure that um, um, labor markets, uh, decent work deficits, and quality of work, and all that are actually ensured. But something important that I would like to mention is that although there is this demographic shift, although there is this aging, the story is not necessarily bad. In fact, um, productivity growth may be key to support uh, a number of uh, in positives uh, in the labor markets, including uh, the relationship with the GDP per capita growth. So what it means is that if, if, if we maintain a productive, uh, productive growth um, that is good enough, we are likely to dominate the demographic effect. And that means that the effect that we uh, may have from aging may not necessarily be as bad. So what it means then is that we will need to, uh, to foster that growth. We will need policies that will encourage that productive growth. But we will also need to train people, to retrain them, to skill them, so that we can avert labor shortages because labor shortages will come in because 
probably uh, people have some low education, so they cannot fill up, you know, vacancies. Uh, they, they could also be schools mismatches. It could be any of these. But we can avert these labor so shortages through training and retraining and ensuring that uh, the productivity growth actually uh, uh, dominates uh, the democratic effect. But what is specific that this report found about older workers, which I think is really important? And somebody said to me last time, which always uh, uh, comes back to mind, uh, and said, you may be young, I'm not very young, of course, you may be young today, but uh, young people of today are uh, older workers of tomorrow. So I'm also in it. I think most of us are in there. Now, uh, the report has found that when we compare to those who are aged between 25 and 54, older workers are facing worse working conditions than those. For example, they are likely to have 18% higher informality. They are likely to have 10% fewer high-skilled occupations. They are likely to be 26% more in agriculture. And we know the difference, the, 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 the different deficits that accrue in agriculture. But they're also 29% more on account and contributing family work. More interesting uh, with other workers is that um, when they lose the job that they have, they are not able to get a similar job when they look for it. Not just that they're not able to get it, but it, for even those who get it, it takes much longer time before they can actually get such a job. At the same time, losing these jobs means losing an income. And losing an income at that age means a lot of effects on their livelihoods as well. At the same time, older workers are not really supported uh, by training. In fact, there's uh, age discrimination in training where human resources management, uh, uh, you know, feel that they should actually develop the young ones because developing older workers is expensive. And so they face worse conditions than those who are in uh, the age of 25, uh, 54, which means again that um, uh, they are a vulnerable uh, population uh, that they, can, they should be looked at uh, uh, you know, as a target group if we're going to make sure that policy-wise uh, we you know, support their uh, improvement in working conditions. At the same time, building social protection systems is not an easy thing uh, for old workers. One, there are challenges of coverage. If you look at that graph, you, you will see that um, to the right side there, population uh, above pensionable age receiving a pension, you'll see that in the Asia Pacific, of course, we have 73.5%, but when you go to the sub-regions, you'll see that South, Southern Asia has only 39.2% of those. Southern Eastern Asia, only 37.8%. And again, you can compare that with the left, uh, which is uh, you know, the public social protection expenditure as a percentage of GDP. The more we invest in there, I think the more population that we can support above. I mean, we see Eastern Asia there, 6.3% of GDP, 98.9% uh, uh, of people that are supported. But again, here we are talking about uh, old workers. We are talking about them not really having a good income but in general, most of the labor market does not have very good incomes because most of the times, 66% of people are actually in informal employment. Now, the high prevalence of very low incomes also does affect um, you know, um, sust uh, sustainability of the social production system. Now, lack of contributions, for example, will also mean uh, lack of funding. This is something that is so special to support uh, our older workers. This is my last slide. And I just want to end by saying that given the characteristics 
of our older workers, but also in general in the labor markets, we cannot afford not to promote decent work, to tackle today's labor market inequalities, and to prepare for aging societies. But it is clear when you read the report that this will have to do with raising productivity. It is clear when you read the report that this will have to do with reducing inequalities in income. It will be clear when you read the report that structural transformation is urgent, that moving from low productive sectors to higher productive sectors will be important because productivity is a real important issue. You will realize that training, that education are always important. You will realize that social dialogue is key, particularly for the things that we want to tackle together as workers, as employers, and as governments. Social dialogue becomes key. And of course, strengthening collective bargaining, but at the same time, moving from the informal economy to the formal economy, what we call the recommendation 204, will even be more important. Formalization will be key uh, in this whole process. Of course, we must invest in social protection systems that are able to take care uh, of uh, our older people. We know that um, a number of other issues will come because of that age. The demand for care, health care, general care for the old will be there. But we must make sure that first and foremost, our social protection systems do support the process. Thank you very much, Chair. I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you, uh, thank you very much, Ken, for that, um, that presentation. Certainly, a lot to unpack in the uh, in the report. Let's turn now to the first of our of our guest speakers to add some additional analysis and discussion to the to these issues. Let me turn first to Dr. Dr. Sinavas Tata from UNSCAP. Dr. Tata, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Steve. I'm very grateful uh, to the International Labour Organization for inviting ASCAP to the launch of this Asia-Pacific Employment and Social Outlook Report, which is, uh, the report is extremely timely, relevant, and perhaps emphasizes some of the most critical challenges that our countries in the region face. What I'm going to do after your wonderful comprehensive presentation, Ken, is perhaps to highlight the policy implications of the data and analysis that have been presented by you, maybe in three areas, just given the short time, and I know uh, Professor Rutia has also so much to offer. First, I'd like to pick up on your discussion on the issue of population aging and its impact in the region. In fact, it's all over. I'm finding everyone and the uncle are writing about it all over in the newspapers. And it's come to light. I'm very happy that it's getting, uh, you know, the attention of the media and policymakers. Better late than never. But there are certain nuances that I'd like to highlight. First, yes. Like Ken put it, our region is one of the fastest aging. Today, one in seven are 60 years or older. But come 2050, one in four is going to be 60 years or older. Society is going to look very different. If you look at North and no, East and Northeast Asia, which is China, Japan, Korea, you're looking at one in three being 60 years or older. Now, that, so by 2050, so we are, essentially the number of older persons in our region would have doubled. Now, how did we get there? Total fertility rates that have contributed very largely, the precipitous drop in a way that uh, in, in 1963, when we had the first Asia Pacific Population Conference, we had a region-wide average of six children, you know, the, the total fertility rate was six. Today, for the entire region, it's 1.9. So it's dropped by more than, you know, it's come down to one third of what it was, less than one third. And in certain, for example, in East and Northeast Asia, this fall has been from 6.5 to 1.2 today. So it dropped by, you know, two one fifth of what it was. So this fall has been precipitous. Combine that with increases in life expectancy. In 1950, we had a life expectancy of 42.9 years for the Today, 
anyone born will can live up to 73 years. And this is the average for the Asia Pacific region. And certain regions are much higher averages. Now, not only are more people surviving to old age, but once they reach there at 60, for example, life, they live longer. For exa example, life expectancy at 60 in our region, when you reach 60, you can expect to live today, you can expect to live for an additional 20 years. And you're adding four years to it by 2050. That means if you're reaching 60 in 2050, you're going to reach at least age of 84 on average. So you're talking about people not only reaching old age, but living much longer. Now, what has happened, and Ken explained it very well, that if you have very sharp drop in fertility and increase in life expectancy, obviously our region, the proportion of older persons has risen very dramatically. Countries in Europe and in developed regions had a very casual stroll when they went up to aging population, a lot of time to adjust. It took 100 years for some of them, for the Frances, the Spains. It took a long time. You know how long it took uh, Singapore and the Republic of Korea? 17 and 18 years, respectively, just to go from 7% aging population to 14% of the population, that fast. Even in our region, there are differences. Australia and New Zealand took more than 60 years, the more developed amongst them. So this fall has been very, very rapid. And I would like to focus on the fact that every region, even the ones which have relat relatively younger populations now, need to prepare. And I'd like to highlight the fact that the two largest, even if you look at India, Oh, we have youthful population. I have the first demographic dividend to harvest. But you're talking about 8% of a population of 1.4 billion. You're talking about more than 130 million older persons, just in absolute numbers. Same apply to Indonesia. So we have some of the very, in fact, some of the countries which have the lower, considered to have youthful populations, also have significant number of older persons and whose issues need to be addressed. Now, this has not happened overnight, and I'd like to come back to the discourse on this. This was an achievement. You wanted to offer women the choice, whether to how many children you owe. You wanted to extend reproductive and cycle, which is our objective. And you have improved health services, people live longer. And yet, when we have the changes associated to it, oh, it's a disaster. It's a bomb. It's a problem. I think we need to adapt. The future is going to be one where populations are going to be older and society needs to adapt. Many countries are saying, oh, I'm going to switch off, I'm going to have more children, have policies where women are going back to having three or four. It's not going to happen. You must get used and adapt to a situation where you will have older, and like Ken says, we need to adapt our labor markets and our economies so that we exploit the capacity of older workers. So what I'm asking for here is that we have a nuanced view where we look at where situation where older persons remain healthy and active longer, and the whole concept of dependency ratios really change. I don't think older persons are, should be seen as dependent just because they reach the age of 60. In fact, it's not true. A lot of them are not that. And for the first time in our region, we are seeing significant cohorts of older and younger populations are going to coexist together. The term intergenerational solidarity acquires a real meaning. It's not a cliche anymore. And we have to find ways of where different generations really support each other. So that is something that even now, as you can see, there are a number of older persons who are in the labor force. Some of them out of choice, but a lot of them because they don't have income security. Because social protection is not available to older persons. They are in the labor market because they have no other option. But we have to find policies where we really in ensure that our older persons are healthy and remain active longer. Brings me to the second point, the importance of social protection. And I think Ken highlighted, we know that during the COVID-19 pandemic, poverty has, draw, has increased. We had additional almost 150 million people who go, got driven into poverty. Even now, when you look at the sustainable development goals, the progress on universal social protection has not been very good. Maybe it's only about 21.7% of the progress that has to be made has been made so far. So it needs to be accelerated. And if we don't accelerate progress, we ex our estimates by 2040, another quarter of a million people will be, driven, will be poorer. And I think the key to our region, as Ken pointed out, is the question of informality. Very 
Informality is the norm rather than the exception in the Asia-Pacific region. And it has many facets. It has self-employed, seasonal farm laborers, daily wage uh, workers, domestic workers, and home-based workers. Even people who are in the formal sector, like gig economy workers and migrant workers, are not getting social protection. Is seeing a reversal. So I think we need to f uh, place more emphasis on social protection to address the realities. Otherwise, poor working people will tomorrow really transition to becoming poorer older people. And decent work, as has been pointed out, is a challenge. We need training and we need active labor market policies, both for the young of today or the older people of tomorrow and people who are already old. I think we have a double challenge there. And I think people, our governments need to realize that extending social protection builds solidarity uh, to combat inequalities. If you're going to have rising inequalities, that in turn will create a lack of solidarity. And therefore, we believe extending social protection or moving towards the universal access to social protection is one of the main important tools of trust building in the society, which is absolutely needed. And my last and final point relates to the low female labor force participation of women all are, all over. We show on an average in our region, female labor force participation is 47% against 75% for men. Many women in, the, in our region are in unpaid domestic and care work and our contrib their contribution to society is not recorded or acknowledged. Women in our region spend 11 hours a day uh, on unpaid care and domestic work, which is four times the amount of time that is spent by men. So very few of them actually access the labor market. So when we look at lower differences in employment between men and women, I also like to think that is also the rates of un unemployment in women are lower because very few of them are actually in the labor market. And wherever they are in the labor market, in many countries, they are overrepresented in the informal sector. If we, according to ILO's estimates, if we add 1% of female employment if one uh, in the in the labor market, the annual GDP growth can go up by 0.16% annual. The others, if we calculate the total amount of GD unpaid care work carried out by women, it adds to $3.8 trillion if you really took that into account, rather than keeping it out of the calculations. So I believe one of the most sustainable and just ways of maintaining labor productivity in light of aging of populations is to get increased women's labor force participation and that can only be done if we invest in policies and programs that reduce, redistribute, and adequately reward care work. The Triple R framework is to recognize the work they're doing, reduce the work, and also redistribute from women to men. And so I think ILO has added a couple of other elements of rewards for care workers as well as adequate representation. We need to improve care infrastructure and also have employment-related care for policies to expand family-friendly arrangements. Thank you very much, ILO, for this report, and I look forward to working with you in, in really uh, bringing it to member states. Thanks. Thank you. Um, thank, thank you very much, Dr. Tata, Dr. Sinivas, for, for that um, intervention. Let's turn now to Dr. Rutia. Dr. Rutia, the, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. First of all, let me thank for this uh, wonderful opportunity and this excellent report. It's very comprehensive and very detailed and also very honored to, to be here with uh, Dr. Silvas. Um, so um, first of all, I'd like to highlight that um, when we talk about aging societies, and just to add to that, um, to, to the point that Dr. Silvas has already mentioned, is that we are not really look at the age at just the number. So we have the concept of relative age and absolute age, so that when we talk about the aging society, it means that we are talking about a society that having a larger share of the older person in terms of the number. But we have to cope with uh, the point that we are not yet talking about their capacity, their ability to, to be empowered. So I think, for first of all, um, I've found many uh, points here listing that aging society is a challenge. 
yeah, I would to I would like to emphasize that is this a, quite a challenge, but at the same time, it could be opportunities. Maybe we can we can emphasize that um, we can highlight on the opportunities in the aging society and how can we maximize the benefits of coming into the aid society. But keeping in mind that uh, we are looking at um, the region with the diverse characteristics. I mean, we have the developed countries that really prepare and already reach the point that they can be able to, you know, the older persons can be able to live in a, a certain level of well-being while we also have a numbers of developing countries that um, having difficulties in coping with the, the situation. So um, in the link to that, then we are going to face a regional challenge. I'm taking the term challenge because we're going to see our numbers of migration increased. Um, in response to the labor shortages, at, as, and also in response to the demand for care. So that, in that sense, we will need uh, more report on data in um, projecting or estimating the impact of what's happening for the, um, in terms of the aid society, for example, how many people are we talking about um, in, in the care economy? And how can we cope with that, in which we would require the um, policy dialogue at the regional level? Because you know there would be a numbers of country would be really suffering from from this um, uh, the short labor shortage just for this particular uh, sector. That's the first first point. And the second point I like to highlight that um, when we talk about the policy in the national level, I think uh, one one of the policies that might, we might add is how to cope or how to empower um, people in on general. Uh, our generations to be um, able to enjoy an, um, in the labor market, you know, even it's already changed. And given that we are facing the uh, increasing in inequalities because of the climate change and also the digital inequalities. So I think perhaps that um, idea would be uh, highlighted as the challenge. This is actually the challenge, especially the country with the high digital inequalities that have to increase um, the numbers of, or the share of formality in the society. And um, so there is another point that can already highlight on the gender, um, gender challenge. But the gender here, we are talking about um, a larger share of older women. And for the older women who are already out of labor force for a long time, it would be really difficult for them to re-enter into the, the labor force. And you will see a larger number of these chair. I mean, so that not only the social security um, policy, but also how we can empower the um, older woman as long, uh, along with their household un unit, unit, sorry, household unit in order to make sure that they can be able to cope with this situation. So um, the other point I like to also mention about the uh, increased in the um, um, intergenerational um, approach that we will going to require in uh, in the telemed context up on the countries. In a sense, uh, this is to highlight the points that Dr. Sri was mentioned as well, because in, with the within the society or within the country that we have uh, various or uh, diverse dimensions of the age um, structure, we will really require the um, you know, assistance within the unit and how can we um, pass on transit from this situation to a better well-being. So I think what I'm highlight would be focusing on the policy because it, in terms of the numbers, it's really um, already very comprehensively documented. And thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Rutia and, uh, and our speakers today. Okay. Um, 
let's let's now turn to any questions um, you may have or any comments. Um, if anyone would like to pose a question, please, um, we'll turn to the floor first. Also, those of you who are following us online, if you'd like to drop any question in the chat, it will be conveyed to me by some magic means and we can post those. Um, any any questions at all, any thoughts anybody would like to make, uh, get started? There's a, a microphone is, is at the back. Please, sir. Sorry about that. Yeah, Jonathan Head from um, uh, BBC. I'm just curious about how much progress governments in this region, particularly Southeast Asia, are making in, in uh, meeting the need for social safety nets, particularly in terms of pension schemes, because it's something that seems to be a yawning gap, and you've raised that challenge. Um, it's just going to become far more, far more acute as this region ages so rapidly. Are you seeing adequate responses by governments I mean, really genuine progress towards providing more universal safety nets and pension schemes for people where there seems to be a, a yawning gap at the moment. Thank you. Thanks. Any, um, any volunteers to take this one on? Dr. Tata? Yeah. Okay. Yes, in Southeast Asia, I think there's an increasing acknowledgement that this is an issue and uh, we member states within SCAP, and it is actually led by a number of Southeast Asian countries who have signed up to a regional action plan for strengthening social protection, which is built on the ILO social protection floor. So we saw at least three to four countries within, our, in, within the Southeast Asia, within the ASEAN region, actually doing assessments of gaps in social protection. For the first time, we are seeing countries actually sitting down because social protection policies are implemented by the different parts of government. And sometimes they're not necessarily speaking to each other, not necessarily coordinated. And we are seeing now perhaps an effort to coordinate this across. They are being, they're seeking assistance of ILO at the country level, but more importantly, they're they are actually doing, a, there's a structured approach within ASEAN, I think, where they're trying to address these gaps. They're sitting down and they understand that this is, that if they don't address it now, in many ways that they will land up with a very big problem of large number of older persons who are there without social protection. Now, uh, uh, many of them do have gone for, they've, they've, we have, a lot of people have reached uh, old age without having contributed to a pension scheme. So some of them are, are, are being helped by social pension schemes, which are essentially non-contributory pensions, which are not necessarily as much as uh, of the level that you would want, but still there are decent stopgap measures. But I do think there are very strong encouraging signs within the Southeast Asian region that they are, they are aging very fast. And if they are to maintain one, they have to, uh, the need for them to really ensure that older peace people are protected for a longer time. But of course they're struggling with the issue of, they're still also coming around to the fact that how do I maintain labor productivity. There is still a lot of, uh, I think, room for them to ensure that older people uh, stay productive for longer, stay longer in the labor force. These have different approaches in different countries, but it's, I definitely see this on their agenda right now. Very high, and it's an issue that many governments are willing to address upfront as part of policy dialogue in the UN itself. Maybe Steve, you can. Yeah, thanks very much. Um, he, uh, my colleague um, has mentioned very well uh, the role that uh, government is playing. I want to mention the role that the ILO is playing in supporting these governments. Um, so the ILO, uh, in its decent work agenda, puts social protection <coughs> as a key pillar uh, in providing and promoting uh, decent work. And so uh, it is already inculcated in the policies that uh, the ILO uh, actually uh, promotes uh, working with government. Uh, but at the same time, uh, the ILO has promoted uh, what we call the Global Accelerator uh, on Jobs and Social Protection, which seeks to coordinate efforts uh, you know, to support 
social protection uh, coverage, uh, you know, working with governments and what we call tripartite uh, constituents uh, to make sure that uh, governments uh, take up an accelerated role in supporting access to social protection. Uh, at the same time, uh, the ILO is promoting the concept of social justice. With it, it is promoting uh, what we call the social justice coalition. One of the pillars of that coalition is actually social protection. And social protection here, meaning access, uh, you know, making sure that uh, even those who are a vulnerable target, like the older workers, are actually taken care of. So the ILO works with the governments uh, to support this and will continue to do that. Thank you. Can I just add something? So uh, just to add to the term social safety net, I think one thing that we have to think of is not just only the government itself, but also we're talking about the the society as a whole. So in the AP countries, we have the families, we have the household to support, but at the same time, we're facing a um, you know, very challenging situation in the sense that the household size, the cultural culture has already changed. So in that sense, it is also emphasized, there is a very um, high, high um, necessity for the government to, to um, readjust and and especially among the developing countries, we require to support the older person who are poor. Okay, thank you. Let me let me turn to a question I have received um, from the chat from Imitaz Mukbil. Um, what will be the impact of increasing usage of robots across many jobs, especially repetitive jobs done by the um, low-income workers? So we all hear an awful lot about AI, technology, Will AI and technology save the Asia-Pacific region from an, the, uh, the woes of an aging population? Ken, over to you. <laughs> uh, well, so a, a number of issues come to mind uh, when we deal with the robotization, uh, if I can use that word. Um, so one aspect is to see uh, whether what impact it will have on those uh, who are probably uh, re less skilled, for example, um, have a law education. Uh, I think what the ILO is doing um, uh, is to ensure that we develop skills, systems, skills upgrading, reskilling, and so on and so on, to make sure that people are able to adjust to other kind of uh, uh, job lines, uh, if you like. Um, but in, in, so, so, so really, it is a, a case where we realize that this is there, robotization will come, some people will lose jobs, but I think it's important to take into account um, that so that we are able to uh, actually promote the right skills uh, so that we uh, ameliorate uh, the effects of those who would actually uh, lose jobs. Uh, in fact, there has been research which has shown that um, uh, adopting to uh, new technologies can also be supported by making sure that people who are losing the job that side are, t uh, are skilled to take up other you know, uh, jobs as well. So I think that would be a good thing uh, for me. I think it is skills development. Okay, okay thank, thank you, Ken. Um, ladies and gentlemen, any, any other questions from the floor? Anything, or from the, the those following us online? Uh, yeah, please, Stefan. Do you want to? Do a, oh, sorry, oh, the the lady at the back, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. But if you can use the mi microphone so the uh, the folks online can hear. Thanks. It is not a question. It's just a comment and. I would like to thank ILO for this very good study. I am Dr. Olivia Niveras from WHO, and I would just like to say that this is very timely because in the health sector, we have been talking about this um, issue. And in fact, Thailand has uh, raised this as one of the key priorities, the falling TFR and the aging society. And the, um, the country has really taken leadership in this area. One of the things I would like to share is that Thailand has this ASEAN Center for uh, Innovation and Aging. And this is one idea that maybe we can think about how the different countries in the region can share their strategies 
and uh, have like horizontal collaboration in terms of how to deal with this issue because it's not only Thailand but a lot of other countries as you mentioned, Dr. And for UN, uh, we have been working on the UN Decade of Healthy Aging and a lot of work has been done in this area and it's really monitored. Uh, in fact, last year we have done the survey to see how the different countries are um, fulfilling the different strategies. And as you know, there are four strategies for the UN Decade of Healthy Aging. Promoting age-friendly societies, um, combating ageism, uh, promoting health plus social care in an integrated way and not just like in silos. And there's another one, uh, long-term care, which you mentioned. So this is something that I would like to share from the UN, and I hope that we can contribute and work together as one society, one government approach. Thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat> yeah, please, Dr. Tata. I think uh, I'd like to thank uh, the speaker for really introducing a very important issue about the fact that if you want to have healthy older persons, one of the key things is to have a uh, I think in terms of Thailand, one of the most spectacular achievements that they have made is the provision of universal health care. And I think Thailand was a country that showed that you could introduce universal health care at a relatively early level of development. It took, it took the commitment, they've stuck to it, and the results will show. Because I think you don't look at healthy aging after a person reaches the age of 60. It's what you do as a younger person and what you do before often that dictates what will be your state of health when you cross 60. So you need to adopt a life course approach if you want healthy older persons. So that's very essential. And the importance of innovation, I mean, there are, when you talk about issues like intergenerational solidarity, what are countries doing? What do you mean by that? Well, you look at Vietnam. Vietnam has a very large number, not of older persons clubs, they're known as intergenerational clubs, where younger persons do community service and teach older person skills uh, in terms of uh, IT skills and skills which are uh, uh, on technology, which older persons may not have. And this really contributes to a much better understanding. And this is a, it's a model that's being adapted in to other countries too. So I think uh, innovation will remain key. If you're going to, I think, telehealth in providing outreach, I think health systems also need to change to really uh, adapt to the needs of older persons. Thank you. Okay. Thanks. Um, I'd like to add this point as well because it's, it's really related to the labor market. When we talk about the working age population, mean we scope people to work. You know, we're assuming that they're going to work starting from 15 to 60 or 65 years old. But I, that's why it comes with the figures. But what I'm going to highlight is that we are have to highlight on the life course approach thinking that how it would be, you know, it, they have to continue to be active, not within the labor market itself, but also maybe in other activities. And that would cause the, um, that would generate the active, you know, healthy aging and also it would reduce the ageism that we are facing right now in terms of entering for older person, relatively older person to, to enter into the labor market. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I have, I have another question from um, following online. Um, a number of countries in the region which are aging rapidly, such as Korea, Singapore, Japan, are, are rich, rich countries. How about countries such as Thailand, which is um, obviously not as um, economically um, far down the road as some of those other countries? What, what kind of steps can a country such as Thailand, which is aging rapidly, take when it has less, perhaps, economic or financial headroom to manage these challenges. Dr. Ruti, I think that's one for you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, in the case of Thailand, right? This is a very challenging for Thailand in particular. I'm, I'm wearing the hat for Thai. <laughs> then, um, because Thai is one of the fastest um, rate of becoming aging, why we are still poor, and that's the point. If you become aged, once we already have some certain level of income, it would be not really in concern. So how would we tackle, tackle this one? It means that we need to at least uh, do, um, like design to do all system, do all track for, 
for the track that they're already old, they're already um, you know, facing a very high challenges, a high challenges in entering into labor market or in having a very poor, decent, um, poor working conditions, then that would be an, uh, one track that we have to help them to make sure that they have opportunities for working, for the decent work and being formalized at a certain point. But at the same time, um, for the another track, for the other track, we have to make sure that the, the new, those who are in the pipeline should be um, encouraged to design their life and having opportunities for work or having a, you know, a better life plan so that they can be able to um, facilitate the, your, their life and maximize their own potentials. But at the same time, for the government side, we have to admit that we have really limited resources in supporting this group of people. That's why we need to make sure that we provide them opportunities. We enhance commodities capacities, and we ensure that everyone in the society joining this initiative, otherwise would be really out of reach of the government to, 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 to do you know, effectively in this situation. And I think, yeah. So um, my take is that um, we need to emphasize the idea that um, this is a life course process. So um, as Dr. Srinivas put it before, we will not wait until somebody uh, is aged for us to start our policies. We need to start immediately mainstream these. From a macroeconomic point of view, I would say this is a core for policies that support growth policies uh, that support productive growth, policies that support redistribution, policies that make sure that these economies are able to stand uh, with such. Um, but of course, the social part of it is important to be able to trickle down the macroeconomic benefits to those who are actually targeted. So to me, this is a core for us to really have better policies for macroeconomic management, better policies to ensure that everybody is included. In other words, inclusive growth promotion, which is also pro-employment. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks for, um, firstly, I, won't, I think Thailand is an uh, upper middle income country, and I think I won't call it poor. There are a lot of countries, and it's That's doing, correct. and it's, it's taken some very important steps. But in terms of, if you're looking at group of countries which are not so developed and yet reaching this stage, there, I think there are some basics. One, there are two, income security, health security. And the best way first, you have to go for universal health care. Without that, you will always, your, you know, unless you really protect the health of the younger people, in the future too, the cost of, of ill health among older persons is going to be far more expensive for society. Universal health care, countries need to progress towards that. Even if you're not doing it all at once, the question. Second, the question is, are we preparing well enough? I don't think we are preparing well enough because we have such a big informal sector that's not going to disappear at the wave of a war. I know formalization is going to be the way to go, but we have large informal sector. We have to find a way of extending social protection to people in the informal sector. There have been some uh, exercises done in this regard, but I think it's the duty of all, whether it be governments, the UN, and others to really find a way in which, innovative ways in which we can, although we cannot afford to have another big cohort of young people aging without having adequate income protection. Otherwise, the load on member states to really provide, uh, again, social assistance in such a large num amount is going to be difficult. We are only going to multiply the problem if we don't find a way of ensuring at least the, the, the working age population today must, we must find ways of ensuring that they can contribute towards the retirement system. And apart from that, I think there are low-hanging fruits. Even now, I find in the public sector, you have retirement ages of 58 and 60, and a young woman having lower retirement age than men. Why is that? I mean, the fact is, women live longer, but yet there are countries, outliers, where women are supposed to retire earlier than men. I think the question is not about extending retirement age in the formal sector, but make it flexible. I think there are certain area, uh, maybe areas of work where older persons would like to be 
in would like to retire earlier. It's a choice. It's their choice if they're ready to. But I think even now there's a huge scope for retirement ages to be extended in a number of countries in the formal sector. Thank you. Just to add a little bit, or in terms of the Thailand context, in the sense that we are because of middle-income country, right? But at, at the same time, we are facing the high income inequality. That's yeah. why we, are t we need to make sure as well that in, in all countries that with this kind of challenge can be, yeah, right? Can be uh, able to uh, cope with this, uh, this challenge and opportunities. Okay. Thank you, Dr. Rotia. Any, any last questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen? Any last uh, call? No, well, if, if that's the case, then let's, uh, we're almost bang on time. Um, I'd just like to, uh, just, just to wrap things up, just like to hand the microphone, just for the last few words, to um, Kumpanada Bunpala, who is the Deputy Regional Director for ILO um, here in Asia Pacific, based in Bangkok. Kunpin, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Thank you so much, uh, everyone. Uh, first and foremost, I'd like to sincerely thank all of you for coming here to be with us uh, today, both uh, being here in the room with us, but also joining us uh, online for this launch of the Asia Pacific Employment and Social Outlook uh, Report. I want to thank a very special way to our speakers, Professor Dr. Ratia Pula or Wise Dean, College of Population Studies, and Director and Director, Collaborating Center for Labor Research, Chulalongkorn University, and to our dear, dear friend, Dr. Sinivas Tata, Director of the Social Development Division of the UNSCAPT. I think uh, both of you have shared a lot uh, of your very interesting thoughts uh, based on the presentation by the ILO team and Ken uh, today. Uh, the ILO is also very grateful for the participation of representatives from the government of Thailand, our social partners, academic and research institute, civil society, our friends from the media, and of course, our colleagues from the UN agencies. Thank you uh, so much uh, for coming. Uh, my colleague Steve already mentioned that the Asia Pacific Employment and Social Outlook is a biennium publication of the ILO, uh, regional office here in, in Bangkok, and uh, we present uh, trends in key labor market indicators and then have particularly theme of relevance uh, to the region. I'm glad to hear feedback that the theme of this year, uh, of this volume, is timely. As this report team is uh, promoting decent work and social justice uh, to manage aging, uh, I hope that the findings of the report have provided catalysts, uh, thinking, uh, thinkers, <laughs> to look about uh, policy options. And we also have heard some very good questions uh, from our audience on policy dimensions to respond to these uh, very challenging trends in, in our region. And of course, uh, from the ILO perspective, uh, we hope that uh, older workers are given opportunities and also they are protected uh, with uh, decent working conditions. We have learned a lot uh, from our speakers here today. We also have learned a lot from the discussions uh, from the audience in the room and the audience who have joined us uh, online. So we hope that uh, we can continue uh, to work uh, together on this uh, very uh, important uh, topic. I think all the questions that we received today provide us very good perspective to look into different dimensions of this uh, very important issue. Uh, finally, uh, allow me and all of us uh, to thank our host, the FCCT, and for me, I have to thank my ILO team for putting all of this uh, report and this uh, presentation together today. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Have a good day. Thanks, everybody. We, we are done. Uh, the report is online. We also, as I say, had the, uh, the, the QR codes and some hard copies here. If you have any questions, if you're a media or if you're just interested and you'd like to follow up with any of us, please shout out. Thanks again for coming. If you're not an FCCT member, please sign up. Please join. It's a great club. We should take every possible opportunity, opportunity to support it. Thank you, everybody. Thanks. Goodbye.